In Daniel chapter 2, there is a vision, a vision seen by Nebuchadnezzar the king. And in this dreamlike vision, he sees a monster man with a head of gold. He sees the arms of silver, the midsection of brass, the legs of iron. But the feet were of iron and clay, and especially the toes. Now listen to what the angel tells, uh, tells Daniel about this, and Daniel relays the message then to the king. Verse 43 of Daniel 2, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, the classical interpretation of this is that the iron represents totalitarianism and the clay represents democracies. But that's not what Daniel said. He said, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Is not this what happened in Genesis chapter 6 when the sons of God saw the daughters of men and produced giants? Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this strange phenomena. And strange it is. Uh, we, we find it strange, J.R., to even to be speaking on this subject. The subject uh, which we broached last uh, on our last broadcast uh, is a subject of UFO abductions. Uh, starting in 1965 with this book by John Fuller, The Interrupted Journey, which chronicled the abduction of Barney and Betty Hill taken aboard a quote-unquote flying saucer, returned, their memory having been erased. It took them years to recall what had happened, and when they finally did, they told the classic UFO story. And J.R., uh, uh, this book became a New York Times bestseller. Uh, there was a movie made called The Interrupted Journey, which uh, appeared both in major motion picture theaters and on television. And so really, starting in 1965, uh, shall we say, an urban myth, uh, the myth of Uf UFO abduction was born. But J.R., it's more than a myth, as we have come to see. Now, on our last television program, Gary read a letter from the President of the United States, Harry Truman, back in 1947, to Secretary Forrestal, wherein he uh, talked about this matter of UFOs and uh, organized Operation Majestic. 12. Gary, tell us about this and let's talk about close encounters of the first kind, second kind, third kind, and fourth kind. Well, J.R., uh, there seems little doubt now that Operation, uh, sometimes called MJ-12, sometimes called Magic, sometimes called Majestic-12, uh, was a high-level secret uh, operation uh, by our government to deal with the UFO problem and with the uh, uh, shall we say, the little green men. They've, they've since come to be called greys. Uh, believe it or not, our government has been involved with the UFO traffic now for over 50 years, and we have a lot of documents uh, in Majestic 12 uh, that are being released more every day, as a matter of fact, as uh, people who have been sworn to secrecy are nearing and approaching old age, and some of them on their deathbeds are revealing secrets. We're finding out that MJ-12 really was a real operation. Our government really has been preoccupied with the whole phenomenon of UFOs. There is some evidence that our government is complicit in UFO abductions, but we don't have time to really go into that. Is it possible that not only our government, but other governments in the world have been involved with this? Absolutely, JR. There's every reason to believe that there is a world awareness of this. And as strange as this sounds, it is biblical. We have to quickly point out, and J.R. just read Daniel 2.43, which speaks of a latter-day phenomenon in which humanity's seed would be corrupted with the seed of another species, just as happened prior to uh, the great flood of Noah. Therefore, we conclude this is happening. We are living in the latter days, and the Bible does speak to this subject, which is why we're bringing it to you. Now, let's talk about the four kinds of encounters with UFOs briefly. This is fascinating. Uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, uh, uh, an astronomer uh, who has since passed on, uh, reasoned 
that there were four types of uh, UFO encounters, and you've probably heard of them, close encounters of the first kind, second kind, third kind, and fourth kind. Uh, first kind is spotting a UFO in the air from a distance. Second kind is witnessing a landing. Third kind is not only witnessing a landing, but having some interaction, perhaps seeing an alien on a close-up basis. Uh, and a close encounter of the fourth kind is an abduction experience in which you or your friends are kidnapped. Uh, they are taken away for a, a period of time. There have been many, many cases. There was a movie made several years ago called Fire in the Sky, which chronicled the real life account of one Travis Walton who was taken. And uh, he was aboard a UFO for four days. His friends witnessed him leaving. They witnessed him coming back. Uh, the man has passed every lie detector test imaginable, JR. Uh, this was a close encounter of the fourth kind. Why are they abducting humans? JR, they are abducting humans, and we're going to get into this uh, particularly toward the end of our presentation today. But in essence, it seems to be a breeding program. And I have here at my right hand a, a book by Harvard psychiatrist Dr. John Mack, a very prestigious man. He has interviewed a number of UFO abductees at great length, concluded that the, there's a, a breeding program. Dr. David M. Jacobs writes this book called The Threat. This man is a tenured professor of history at Temple University, one of the highest seats of learning in our country. And he has documented over 600 cases of UFO abductions and has concluded in his writing that they have a breeding program going. And, and as he has fought academia. That is, uh, secular academics do not like this idea. They don't like the notion that there are aliens interbreeding with humans. And both uh, John Mack and, and Dr. Jacobs have fought tremendous pressures in order to bring these books out. But they say we had to bring them out because the facts are so clear. Now, this is the stuff of science fiction thrillers oh, and yeah. movies, uh, all of the B movies, all the way back to the 1950s, the body snatchers. Yes. Uh, uh, other types of uh, movies have been made about this. Uh, but this is really going on, you say? Absolutely. I have a book here, for example, uh, written by, and I've got a, you'll have to forgive me juggling these books. I've got a stack of a half dozen books over here. This is a famous book by Bud Hopkins called Intruders. This book chronicles the case of a young lady whom he called Kathy Davis to protect her real identity. Kathy Davis, uh, it can be clearly documented, over a long period of time was abducted and impregnated, and her fetuses were harvested at a certain point in her pregnancy. This was even documented by ultrasound. That is to say, she, would, she went to her doctor, discovered she was pregnant, had an ultrasound, the fetus was present, and then mysteriously, a couple, three weeks later, the fetus would be missing. And uh, uh, later on in her abduction experience, she learned that, that uh, the little uh, fetus had been taken back to wherever they go, had been nurtured, chemically in some way using some sort of uh, highly advanced process had been brought to maturity and Kathy Davis says that she was actually introduced to her own child which was a hybrid human alien child. Now I'm sitting here in front of a television camera talking about this subject and I'm half embarrassed even to be using these words. They are so strange coming out of my mouth. Am I really telling the truth? Well, J.R., I have concluded that this is the world we live in at the end of the 20th century. According to Daniel, whoever these uh, people are that have to do with the feet and toes of this yeah. beast, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That means they are not of the seed of men. That's right. And it says, but they shall not cleave one to another. In other words, they will not be successful and what they are doing. That is correct. And it is at that point that the rock formed uh, without hands comes and smashes this um, world system and becomes the messianic kingdom. It yeah. says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. 
So, Gary, uh, there certainly seems to be some interaction here with demonic creatures. Oh, in absolutely. fact, that is the big fight, isn't it? It's the the fight, fight between good and evil, God and the devil. And, J.R., it's got to be emphasized that when Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against all those, uh, those dark forces in the heavenlies, this is not fiction. This is the truth. And only today are we beginning to see those dark forces begin, they're making their work uh, more or less visible to human eyes. That means we've got to be close. Wow. There's more. We'll tell you about it when we return in just a moment. The Bible talks about angels and demons, but does not tell us much about them. We have no real clue as to what they are or where they came from or what they're doing. We have only the few chapters in the Bible that allude to these creatures. On today's program, we're discussing this UFO phenomena called abductions. And we look back to Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took wives, and from them came monstrosities of genetic aberration. Mm -hmm. Gary, let's talk about some of the historical folk legends mm -hmm. of these, shall we say, demons. They've been well, called many things in different cultures down through history. Yeah, our, our word demon comes from the Greek diamon. Uh, Hesiod, in his work called Works and Days, wrote that the diamond were the ghosts of those killed in the great flood when Atlantis perished. And he considered the diamond to be the friends of men, that they walked among men, they were semi-visible, occasionally they would fade in and be visible, and then they'd fade out. We call them demons, and virtually every culture in the world has some belief system concerning the demons. Uh, Jesus believed in demons without a doubt and believed that they were very, very uh, prevalent when he visited the, the, the first century uh, uh, culture of Israel. They had the ability to possess men. Absolutely. The, he believed that they could come in and possess men. Uh, think about this. Think about the, our common English words like vampire, werewolf, ghost, goblin, troll, uh, in gnomes, uh, gnomes fairies, fairies. Yeah. and a fairy we tend to think of as like a Tinkerbell, a little, uh, little winged, pretty little girl or something. But actually, a fairy is a whole class of being which, when studied, uh, reveals itself as demonic. In uh, the British Isles and Europe, there are fairies and little people who are said to dwell in the forests. Uh, the little people uh, have long been thought of as mischievous. They have been thought of uh, as um, uh, perhaps people who could come and steal p belongings, even children, by the way. Uh, Jacques Vallée, uh, who is a brilliant writer, by the way, has written oh, probably 10, 15 books on the UFO phenomenon, wrote a book in 1969 called Passport to Magonia, Magonia being a European name for fairyland. And he talked about how uh, there is a, a, a longstanding European belief <clears throat> in fairies being able to take people away, that is, kidnap, a, kidnap them against their will. He also talks about uh, uh, the, the dwellers of Magonia as living in some kind of a parallel world that's just beyond the veil, and that uh, it's very possible that, that they can take people into that world, and no time will pass. And when the person comes back, uh, he's the same age that he was when he left, but, but all of his friends are now 20 years older. All of this has the same flavor as the UFO phenomenon. In fact, the word changeling is associated with fairyland, a, a, a common European belief uh, and shared even by people like Martin Luther was that these fairies could steal a baby out of a crib and substitute one of their own for it, called a changeling. And this baby would look exactly like the one stolen, but it would be a sort of a demonic creature. And Martin Luther acknowledged his belief in changelings during his own lifetime. So this is, a, a, this is not an obscure or superstitious belief, but rather has been held by some very high, 
high and mighty uh, thinkers down through European history. Uh, the fairies have mutated themselves in our, uh, in our era, JR, and they're no longer little creatures with wings or ugly little goblins. Well, maybe they are in the case of the greys, but, but now they have transformed themselves into spacemen. They say, we're here from outer space and we're coming back to Earth in our spaceships to help humanity or we have our own little program that we're doing, uh, be patient with us, uh, let us kidnap you, we mean you no real harm. When in fact, JR, I believe that all they've done is, is change their outer appearance to something that's more palatable to the scientific 20th century mind. Mm. In 1992, in June, on June 13th, a, a meeting was held at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and intellectuals were there for five days in a conference uh, from, I guess, all over the world. Tell us about this, um, this meeting at MIT. Well, JR, I, I wish I could. I'm holding the book that, that chronicles the meeting. It's a good, thick book, 500 pages or so. Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, Alien Abduction, UFOs, and the Conference at MIT. If you can imagine, MIT is our most prestigious uh, uh, technical college in the United States. The real brains of this country technically attend MIT. Uh, a conference was held there. It was essentially concluded, given the evidence presented by dozens of people, including Dr. Jacobs, Dr. Mack, and many others, that the UFO abduction uh, phenomenon is indeed documentable. Uh, they document uh, close encounters of the fourth kind, which include physical examinations, implants, apparent impregnations, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have time. This is a 500-page book, and we have just a few minutes. But, JR, we live in a world in which our top scientists are now beginning to ponder UFO abduction as a reality. Now, their conclusion is there is a program afoot. There is that a program. every UFO scene, every sighting for the past 50-something years has been either on their way to an abduction mm -hmm. or f coming from an abduction. Um, it, it all centers around uh, breeding. In fact, uh, yeah. I guess cattle mutilations may have something to do with this as well. Even cattle mutilations, which now are uh, thought to be methods used by the abductors to obtain tissues for growth cultures. That is, they, they take certain parts and tissues from cattle and are able to use them in some way we don't understand for, for their own uh, uh, program. And again, we come now, now to the conclusion of this presentation by saying that there is a program. Put the quotes around that and call it the program. And the conclusion of the scientists who have discussed it Bud Hopkins, Dr. John Mack, Dr. David Jacobs, uh, three or four other scientists who presented papers uh, have, have suggested there is a program. The agenda is fourfold. Number one, abduction. I'm quoting Dr. David Jacobs. The aliens initially select human victims around the world, institute procedures to take these humans and their progeny from their environments without detection. Number two in this program is what's called the breeding program. The aliens collect human sperm and eggs. Uh, and this was the case even in the Barney and Betty Hill case back in 1965, which we talked about. Genetically alter the fertilized embryo, incubate fetuses in human hosts, and make humans mentally and physically interact with the offspring for proper hybrid development. Stage three of the program is called hybridization. The aliens refine the hybrids by continual alteration and breeding with humans over generations to become more human while retaining crucial alien characteristics. Uh, perhaps humans are also altered over time and acquire alien characteristics. And part four of the program, quoting Dr. Jacobs again, the aliens prepare the abductees for future events. Eventually, the hybrids or aliens themselves integrate into human society and assume control. And that is a key uh, part of this whole thing. Uh, abductees are often told certain things, like an, a, uh, an abductee named Jason Howard was told that a change was coming, and that it would happen around 1999. 
Uh, another uh, abductee, Claudia Negron, was told in 1977 when she asked how soon this big change would come, uh, they told her very, very soon, perhaps within two or three years. Another abductee named Reshma Kamal was told that after the change, there will be only one form of government. Uh, the aliens will be in complete control. There will be no necessity to continue national governments. There will be only one system and one goal. J.R., that sounds satanic to me. You know, it's interesting that Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, wrote that Adam had received a prophecy from God that the world would be destroyed once by water and finally by fire. Well, we know about the flood of Noah. It's given to us in Genesis chapter 6 and in the chapters following. The interesting thing about all of this is that we now await this fiery judgment. Mm -hmm. And in Revelation chapter 20, we are told that the demons and those who do not believe in God are cast into a lake of fire. Is this possibly the final conflagration? Is this the end of it all? Well, for them, I think it is, J.R. Uh, I believe that what we're facing here uh, is what uh, Jesus referred to as the days of Noah, being a figure of speech for that time when demons would rush forth and control events on the surface of the earth. And I think we're seeing the beginnings of it again right now. And They're wanting to save the human race from, from a fiery from, judgment? From a fiery judgment. <laughs> That's interesting. Wow. Well, our conclusion is that these UFO creatures are demons.